welcome everyone. Thank you so much for spending part of your evening with us tonight. Uh, my name is Ann Bennett. I'm the executive director of the Laurel Historical Society and I want to welcome you to the first of our collection conversations. So this is a new program that we're doing at the Historical Society to kind of take an informal look at our collections, items that you might not have seen before, uh, some ones that you have, and just kind of go behind the scenes and maybe demystify a little bit about the museum, how uh, we care for our items, how we use them in our research and our exhibits, uh, and then just kind of have a conversation. So uh, this is a, a good point to talk about uh, some Zoom housekeeping. So even though we are in a webinar format, we did want to hold true to this conversation aspect. So we invite you to um, put your questions into the Q&A box and uh, also talk with us through the chat box. You can chat uh, directly to uh, myself and to our panelists if you have any questions or comments, uh, if you have additional information, anything like that. So even though we can't hear you or see you, uh, you are still part of this conversation and we invite you uh, to be active participants. So if you're on a computer, laptop, tablet, uh, smartphone, uh, your options for participating either through the chat or the Q&A should be down toward the bottom of your screen. If you just click or expand that, you should be able to type anything uh, directly to us. Uh, so I wanted to just take a second and uh, briefly pass it over to my other co-panelists. Uh, we have uh, Monica Sturdivant and Ms. Sandra Johnson. So Monica, I'll just uh, pass it over to you and have a brief introduction. My name is Monica Sturdivant. I'm the Assistant Director at Laurel Museum. Thank you for joining us tonight. Um, I've, yeah, I guess I've been at the museum since 2007. Um, and I'm just excited to show some of the things that we get to see behind the scenes all the time. Great. Uh, Ms. Sandra, do you want to introduce yourself? I, I'm sure there's some people that don't know your face. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. <laughs> I'm Sandra Johnson. I'm the historian for St. Mark's United Methodist Church, an historic black church in, uh, in Laurel. And I'm very excited to join uh, the other panelists tonight. And hopefully, we'll all be um, uh, educated. Uh, we'll learn something about the Black history of Laurel. And um, I'm hoping that if you have any questions or if there are any members from St. Mark's and if you recognize something, that you use the question and answer or the chat just to. Uh, give additional information that you have so that uh, every so that the entire presentation can be enhanced. But good evening to everyone and thank you for joining us tonight. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much for that. Uh, yeah, so I, I reiterate what Monica and, and Sandra said. Thank you for joining us. And this is just going to be a learning experience all around. So like I said, this is the first of our collection conversation. And this month we are focusing on celebrating Black History Month. So we wanted to focus on some of the images from our collection that celebrates uh, the African American experience in Laurel uh, which runs uh, very deep and very long. So we have some iconic images that you have probably seen in some of our publications or our exhibits, and then some that we haven't uh, shown before and that we have some questions and some mystery about. So we're hoping to share this experience with you tonight and get some uh, additional stories and insight into our collection. So if I try to switch the screen here, All right, well, let me know. There we go. Uh, the screen. Okay. <laughs> okay, great. Uh, so this is excellent. So we're going to start off with some, um, some really great images, and we'll move into one of the iconic images in just the next slide. But these all come from what we call the Sadler Photograph Collection. Uh, named after Bert Sadler, who was a Laurel resident. Uh, he lived around the turn of the century uh, in Laurel, and he was uh, a photographer, and a lot of his photographs uh, were also made into early postcards. So we have a lot of his prints uh, and uh, his uh, photographs, and the medium that he used uh, to take these pictures 
uh, is called glass plate negative. So we have uh, the actual, what it, just what it says, they're negative images, but they're on like rectangles of glass. Uh, so that was a kind of an early photography medium. And what you would do then is then you would develop the, the negatives similar to how you would do with modern photographic paper, uh, and then the image would come out. So we have not only the original glass plate negatives in our collection, but then we have these great uh, digital images uh, in our collection as well. Uh, and so a lot of the photographs that uh, Bert Sadler took are just kind of daily scenes in Laurel. So um, a lot of his family or relatives, there's buildings uh, in Laurel and houses, which is really great because there's beautiful old houses along Route 1 or Lafayette Avenue in particular that are not there anymore. So there are great documentation of some of these early residences in Laurel at the turn of the century before the commercial expansion of the town. Uh, and we have some information. So Bert Sadler did keep, um, I'll say scant. Monica, is that a good, <laughs> good word to use? Uh, so as Monica knows, conducting uh, a lot of research requests uh, from the archives, uh, is there's not a lot of information associated with many of his photographs. Uh, so we have a rough idea of the time frame. Uh, and sometimes we have location. Uh, we know, for example, that he would take photographs in Washington, D.C. or in Havre de Grace up in northeastern Maryland, uh, but uh, most of them are in Laurel. So, uh, for example, these um, great pictures, these three pictures you see here, we don't know anybody's names. We don't know where they were taken in particular, um, but so all that we would have are the photographic clues and to do the analysis on uh, the women and the children's dress, uh, maybe the hairstyles, maybe some of the background images we'd be able to have. Um, but Monica, do you have any other, anything to add about these images? Yeah, though these images, um, so we have a number, each, each image has a number, um, and all of the Sadler images have, um, well, the Sadler collection has an index with numbers and descriptions, but not every image has a description. So like they'll have numbers, but so they, I think these three, the one on the left, the girl with the cat, that one has a description. The other ones don't, but there were numbers that kind of described what could be going on in those photos, but they weren't, they didn't coincide with the numbers for the photos. You know what I mean? So they, so I think that the other numbers told about those photos, but they didn't match. So they had a number and a description, but not a number that matched the photo. But it's, it seemed like they were similar to what they described in those photos, if that makes sense. So <laughs> yeah, it, it does. And it's a, it's a little, it's a little weird because of his document yeah. doesn't exactly match up, but kind of from the way that they're grouped and some of the other descriptions, you can kind of put them in an order where we can, we, we can match them up with, with confidence. Um, but I'm going to move on to... I have a question. Yeah, was sure. Bert Sadler, was he an African-American? That's what I was going to say. Uh, Bert Sadler was not African-American. But he had, you know, he, he photographed different people in Laurel. And so in celebration of Black History Month, we also wanted to show some of the photographs that he had of African-Americans in Laurel in the collection. So... Thank you. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll pass it over to, to Monica and uh, Sandra if you want to talk about, uh, this is again one of probably the most iconic image uh, we have uh, from the Sadler collection. This is of the Emancipation Day Parade. Yeah, so this one, um, so it would have been the early 1900s, we think 1910 or 1911. Um, so this is the Emancipation Day celebration. Um, it's is, Sandra, is this the longest running celebration in Laurel? The longest running? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. I, I thought I saw it in one of your papers or okay. research. Yes, it is. And yeah. in fact, it's one of the um, oldest African American celebrations in the United States, as a matter, yes. as a matter of fact. Um, I think this photo was taken on Main Street, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and I think it was, as you said, around 1910. Um, the parade, it's said it's always been um, a, the largest event um, 
in the Laurel area, in the Grove area. And um, because of the location of Laurel between Baltimore and Washington, people used to come and, you know, um, just stay the entire weekend. And um, so you had a lot of people from Baltimore, Washington, the entire surrounding counties. And it was just a very large celebration. I spoke with, I interviewed uh, at that time, uh, a lot of our um, seniors who remembered it back in the day and they compared it to what it's like today. They said it's nothing like it is today with the number of people, um, the vendors, you know, it was just a, a great celebration that uh, Laurel sponsored each year. Mm -hmm. I like this photo because it's, if you look at photos, a lot of photos from that time, a lot of people are posed, um, everything is planned, but this is one of the photos that shows an actual event happening. Um, so he must have probably set up somewhere and just kind of took pictures as people walked by um, instead of saying, okay, pose still, pose. So this is, this is, I think this is one of the closest things we have to a, a, a snapshot at that time so definitely the parade mm -hmm. yeah. yeah i think that's a, a great point monica and it stands in great contrast to the three pictures we just saw uh you know that's because they you know are in daily life but they're still kind of posed and you can imagine with the old photography equipment that you know they pr probably had to sit still you know for a little bit so um and then i wanted to go on because we also have a second well, if, if you don't mind, I'm just, just going to read from the chat. Um, Ken Scripsa, he said, I think this was taken from the Sadler Home Pharmacy on Main Street. The house across the street and the Sadler Home are still there. Sadler, Sadlers live next to the Methodist Church. Oh, okay. Yeah, perfect. So that would make, that would make sense. That, that goes to your point, Sandra, about it being on Main Street and then also Monica where, you know, he had a a vantage point to, to set up his camera and his equipment. So probably from his house or his porch would be a, a really safe place. Uh, so I'm just going to just talk real quick about what I like about this second picture. And it, again, you can see it's similar, but uh, I'm a band geek. So I love, I love seeing the horns. I love seeing the, uh, the music uh, and the musicians and just knowing that that was uh, an early part of the parades, I think it is just phenomenal. Just, you know, celebrating not only with, with floats and uh, festivities, and you can see people out in their best dress, and it was just a really festive time, but also to know that, you know, their the musicians were involved too, I think it's really great. This is great. Yeah, I don't think I've ever seen this photo. This is really great to see the uh, horse-driven buggy and uh, the band, and, um, you know, I see it was probably hot because I see the lady walking with the umbrella to keep, you know, to uh, keep her out of the sun. And uh, I, I really like this photo. It's really great. And as you said, the way that the people were dressed. So, yeah, I, I think I think it's great. So, again, we have kind of, you know, two images of the same thing and, and they are part of the same story, but they tell, you know, slightly different, you know, aspects of it, which I think is great. Uh, so let's, let's see if we can go on. So the next point I, I just want to talk about is we talked about uh, the Sadler photograph collection, and now we're just going to show you an image from the John Brennan collection. And so what mu museums commonly do is that they will categorize their items typically by a collection, and that collection could be named uh, for a person, so the person who took the photographs, like Bert Sadler. Uh, in this case, uh, John Brennan was uh, a, a historian uh, of early Laurel. Uh, we have our research library at the Historical Society uh, named in his honor, uh, and we have a lot of his uh, photographs and uh, notes uh, that he took. Um, and, and, and it's really great because he, he was probably very passionate about history because he would have notes uh, on the back of the photograph. So we have, uh, you know, a, a little more detail than what we had with Bert Sadler's collection. Uh, and so we were able to match up a photograph and the information that he wrote uh, about uh, Miss Bertha Moore. So the photograph uh, was one that he took in our collection. This was taken in 1970. 
uh, when he talked to her uh, and interviewed her, and we were able to put the notes together uh, for one of our past exhibits, uh, as well as do additional research. And we put it together in kind of our biography spotlight is what we're calling it. Uh, so uh, our, the, the staff, Monica and I worked on this, uh, and one of our board members, Alicia Fields, I also worked on it and did the template for us. So it's uh, just a really great way to dive in and do uh, a very personal approach to celebrating Black History Month and uh, looking just beyond the photograph. Uh, you know, if you, you look at Miss um, Bertha, you know, she, it looks like she has a lot, a lot of stories to tell um, and lived a, a great life. And so now we, we have that information based off of the files that we had from John Brennan's notes uh, and, the, uh, and the photograph. Um, Sandra and Monica, was there anything else that you wanted to talk about? Uh, I know Sandra, um, there, she was very instrumental at St. Mark's as well. Yes, she, she was. Uh, um, in fact, in our um, archives, when St. Mark's was uh, renovated, uh, well, the consecration service was in 1979. I can't remember offhand when they actually started. We have a great picture of Miss Bertha and uh, Reverend um, Levi, I believe, uh, with the shovel for the during the groundbreaking um, ceremony that we had. And uh, as I said, she was uh, one of the great saints of St. Mark's. So she was just a wonderful lady. Well, thank you for sharing that. And it's, it's, it's great to know more about it. And that's kind of the point of these conversations is to have the story behind the photograph and, and to know uh, a deep history of uh, a life well-lived and, and so deeply connected to the early history uh, of Laurel, uh, the Grove, St. Mark's, uh, and even uh, as some of the biography mentions uh, to other African-American communities uh, close to Laurel, and in this case, Halltown, um, off of Route 197. Um, well, I don't know if we have the other slide, but she also remembered that she was a uh, teacher at the uh, school number two. I don't yes. know if you have that slide included. Yeah, we'll, uh, yeah we're, we'll move into the museum oh, exhibit. Okay. Okay. Yeah, just a few more slides and then uh, we'll jump in with that. But it, again, that's another kind of dimension to it. So we have her, we have uh, her schooling. Uh, and again, I think it's great that, uh, as we'll see in just a few slides, uh, Ms. Bertha not only went to uh, this school, but then she taught there later uh, as well. Uh, so what I want to talk about here is that different ways to, to use our collection. And as we said, uh, sometimes we get research requests from people asking for a copy of a particular image. Uh, I know Monica um, is kind of our, our researcher in that regard, so she feels a lot of research. Uh, and if you wanted to talk a, a little bit about your, um, your research process, but we have, in addition to the images, we have what we call vertical files. So we have newspaper clippings and additional information. Um, so Monica, I don't know, did you wanna jump in and just kind of say anything about <laughs> What you have to kind yeah, of do? Um, yeah, well, a lot. Um, a lot of times, people will email us or call us, um, and if they have a question, and so one of the first things that we do is we check our our vertical file and the collection, depending on what the question is. If it's an image, then we search our images. Um, we do have a fee for images, so we. Um, give the, the person our research policy where they fill out the form and um, the process begins there. And if, you know, a lot of times people will just email a question. Um, sometimes people will ask a question about what they've seen online or on, on, on Facebook or Instagram or on the website, or maybe they had a school project or maybe they're doing family research. So they'll just email us and we help them as much as we can. That's great. And a lot of the, the questions range, like Monica said, you know, from for family history or school projects. Uh, and I, I will say that Monica has done an incredible job of uh, jumping in because this past year with the pandemic, people uh, really increased their research requests because they had a yeah. lot of time on their hands. So, you know, genealogy questions, family history were, were very popular. Uh, but uh, another way that we, we do the research 
is uh, not just for research requests for, for individuals or for projects, is that we also use our, our own collection items to inform our interpretation. Uh, and the, the largest way that we do that interpretation is through our museum exhibit. So every year, technically every year, we have a new exhibit. So our current exhibit is uh, still celebrating the 150th anniversary of Laurel. So it was intended to stay up for all of 2020. Uh, we opened it in February and it was open for six weeks before the museum had to close due to the pandemic. Uh, but we still intend to transition and uh, move it to um, a display that fully encompasses everything that happened in 2020. And I'll speak to that in just a few slides. But I wanted to show that, and again, in the current exhibit, we focused kind of topically on the 150 years since Laurel was incorporated in 1870. And uh, this display shows uh, the grade school days and uh, children and, and childhood. Uh, so you can see there's some artifacts displayed here as well as some images uh, talking about the different schools. So uh, school number one, the uptown school, uh, school number two, the colored school, and then school number three, the downtown school. Um, so uh, I wanted to just talk about this before we talk about uh, the specific um, uh, schools. And this, again, this is a copy uh, a, photo, a photographic copy of uh, a photograph that has seen better days, unfortunately. Uh, and what we did when we were uh, kind of in the planning process uh, is, you know, we put this picture out on social media to see if anyone had additional information for us. Uh, and uh, actually one of the staff members at uh, Pilate High School reached out to us and said that they could help to kind of restore uh, the photograph for us. And so that's, copy turned into this. So a digitally kind of enhanced and restored. So there are some, you know, kind of caveats and, and kind of, you know, issues that you have to think about, you know, in terms of how to, you know, how to accurately and ethically represent uh, people who, as we can see, might have had part, you know, part of uh, their, their face missing in, in some of the torn areas. Uh, but this uh, enhancement really helps us um, get more information from the picture. Uh, and I'll, I'll turn it over to Sandra to, to talk about how this enhanced picture uh, ended up um, being a lot of fun to look at and, and giving us a lot of information. Right, uh, well, I had reached out to several, uh, you know, my friends at St. Mark's and uh, members and uh, because I'd never attended the Laurel Grove School, but as, as quite a few people in the Grove did because this, this we assumed this picture was taken anywhere either in 1959 or 1960 because we knew uh, from the people who were in it. Um, the Laurel Grove School probably at that time had uh, two classrooms and one classroom was first, second, and third grade, and the other was fourth, fifth, and sixth. And we determined that this was the, um, probably the first, second, and third grade class. Uh, we were able to identify about 10 people. Um, I don't know if, can you all see where I'm pointing? Or is that just uh, on my screen? No, I can't see. No, okay. I, I, I. Okay, well on the first row, uh, we were able to identify the, from the, starting at the left, uh, the second uh, person from the left, the young lady in the red plaid with the red socks, we identified her as Brenda Osborne. Um, the last young lady in the beautiful red dress on the first row, Barbara Jones. Um, on the second row, the second young lady in the white from the left uh, said she was Viola Matthews. Um, the fourth young man from the left, uh, James Reese, in the suit with the uh, bow tie. Um, two down from the right in the center in the white uh, shirt, uh, Ronnie Wallace. Then next to him in the red with the white collar, the red plaid with the red bow in her hair, uh, Jackie Garnett. Uh, on the third row, 
Uh, fourth person down, once again, looks like he had on the little suit was Edward Nicholson. And then on the fourth row, the first person, Carlos Ransom. Uh, the third person on the row, on that row, the young lady in the light blue, Loretta Tom Thomas. Uh, two down from her, the young lady in the pink or the orange was uh, Linda Cager. In the middle, uh, the young man with the suspenders with the white on, uh, Norwood Smith. Uh, two down from him in the blue, Vernell Watkins. And the last young lady on that fourth row was Vivian Powell. We had a lot of fun. I'd like to, you know, thank uh, David Burley. I think George Gibson helped out, uh, Deborah Ford. Uh, we had a lot of fun going through this photo, trying to pick out people who are probably now in their, well, 60s or 70s and how they looked in uh, their, their early school years. And we also determined that the, the teacher was probably Miss Neal. And um, we said, we said approximately this picture was taken either 1959 or 1960. And the school closed in 1962. So, um, because at that time, the majority of the, the children in the Grove in Laurel did attend either OW Fair or Laurel Elementary. Uh, and the Grove School was com composed of young people from um, Laurel the Grove or from the community of Oakcrest in Laurel. We got a lot of cotton. People were really happy to see that picture on Facebook. Yeah. Um, we got so many calls about that picture. Um, as a matter of fact, the, the day that we were closing because it was announced that the buildings had to all close because of the pandemic, someone was coming in as I was closing. Please, can we see the picture? So a couple came in and they, we, we, they, went, they just wanted to go down and see the picture. And they were, some of the names that you mentioned, I recognize a lot of them because they were, <laughs> They were, mm -hmm. that's so-and-so. So yeah, people were very excited about the picture. Some, we, we got a lot of calls just saying, thank you for posting that, you know, and I have names. So. <laughs> really yeah, I, I think fun. it's great. So I, again, yeah, if you have names, if you recognize yourself or <laughs> someone yeah. in that <laughs> picture. Uh, yeah, Ms. Sander did a great job uh, with her friends of recognizing what just about a, a quarter uh, of the people and there looks like there's about 40 or so students. So if you, if you have additional information, we would love to hear it and yeah, we would also love to, to show you the photograph as well. So, um, and then Ms. Sander, did you want to talk a little bit about the evolution of the, the schools in the Grove just real quick to finish oh, okay. out the, the school okay. section? The, um... And then the first picture, I'm trying to um, locate, I, I don't recognize that. Of course, I do recognize the second one that's labeled uh, the colored school on West Street. This, this is a uh, residence, now residence, that's across the street from St. Mark's. And um, this school was um, opened, I believe, in 1830. I have to... No, I'm sorry, it was opened in 1884, and that school was there until 1930, and it was on West Street. Then when the Laurel Grove School opened, the Laurel Grove School opened on 8th Street, and that was there from 1930 until um, 1962. But uh, we did, when I interviewed, um, well, when I interviewed some of the older persons in the church, of course, uh, they did not attend the school, but they remember it being a school and that uh, Miss Bertha Moore was one of the teachers at the, the colored school, as it was called, school number two. Because as you mentioned, there were three schools in Laurel and this was the uh, colored school. So um, as I said, the now it's, it's a residence. Uh, and then when I look, every time I look at that building, I say, how in the world could this have ever been a school? I mean, you know, <laughs> because of the, 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 the size of the building, but, you know, 
uh, I guess there at that time didn't really have as many students as we think about today going to school, but uh, it has a lot of significance to the uh, history of uh, the Black community in Laurel. Yeah, thank you. That, that's amazing. Again, it is a little mind boggling, you know, to think about that it just looks like just like a simple little cottage type house and for it to be not only be so old, but to have such an amazing history from, you know, from a house to a school, you know, to a residence. So. And I saw someone put in the chat about it having an outhouse. I'm sure it did. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure when that building was first opened as a school, there was no indoor plumbing. Yeah, that's amazing, yeah, especially if it goes back to the 1880s, like you said, again, that's just yeah, really phenomenal. Um, so let me just uh, talk about just real quick what we, we plan to do. So like I said, we are hopeful that at the latter part of this year that we will be able to open the Laurel Museum again. And we will still have the core part of our 2020 exhibit celebrating the 150th anniversary uh, of the incorporation of the city of Laurel. Uh, but what we're really going to focus on is 2020. So a lot of times that, that end year doesn't get uh, captured in the historical record, but 2020 <laughs> was not any uh, ordinary year. So what we're working on now is transitioning the standing exhibit to really showcase the events uh, and experiences that everyone encountered in 2020. So that will include, uh, of course, the pandemic, uh, people's um, you know, reaction to that, the, with the schools closing, the uh, museums closing, uh, and the, you know, the mask mandates, businesses closing. So we'll be focusing on that. And um, we'll also be focusing a large part on uh, the protest for social and racial justice. Uh, some of which took place in Laurel, uh, of course, in, in DC as well. Uh, so we've been collecting materials. Uh, you can see this is uh, a, a snap from our uh, Instagram page uh, that shows some of the, the signs that people have donated to our collection. So uh, we encourage you, if you have materials uh, that you have created and that you took place, uh, or if you took part in uh, the protest either in Laurel or in DC uh, or anywhere in the area that you talk to us, we would love to know more about your experiences, uh, what, what happened and when you took part in it. And if you have any signs or photographs from that day, we have both the physical collection as you've been seeing, uh, but we also have a digital archive as well. So if you took pictures with your phone or videos or anything like that, uh, we are gonna incorporate that into uh, the, the reopening of our 2020 and 2021 exhibits. Uh, and then just real quick, uh, I wanna move on here in the interest of time, but uh, again, we also were looking at, you know, different ways of, of using our uh, collection materials for exhibits, but in 2019, we had our healthcare and medicine exhibit, and uh, Sandra was uh, gracious enough to kind of put together an effort where uh, some of our researchers and volunteers from the museum could talk to some of the older parishioners over at St. Mark's, and we had a, a wonderful afternoon after uh, Sunday services just talking to them and, and hearing what they remember, and we were... <laughs> we were uh, feverishly taking notes, uh, and one of the names that came up was uh, Dr. Hudson. And this was not something that we had in our files. We didn't have any information on him. Uh, and um, one of our uh, exhibit um, committee members um, and, and other um, committee members as well, uh, Karen Lubinecki, uh, she you know, really kind of dove into this. Uh, and we were able to come up with a lot of additional information on him. Uh, she was able to reconnect with uh, some of his descendants and family members. Uh, so we um, were able to kind of put together a much bigger picture uh, of Dr. Hudson uh, from what the uh, information given to us um, from St. Mark's. Uh, so I know, Sandra, you said that uh, you're a little too young to, to remember um, Dr. Hudson, but you, but you knew the name well. Uh, do you have anything uh, else to share about him? Uh, when we, when I, uh, when Karen approached me about uh, being involved in the exhibit, I uh, gathered a group of people at St. Mark's and Karen came in to interview them. And um, they all spoke very highly of Dr. Hudson. 
and um, they reminded me, well, brought to my attention really that the house that's shown there is a house that's still occupied in, in Laurel, in the Grove, and it's across the street from the, well, at one time Emancipation Park, I guess now from the library parking lot. And um, as I said, they spoke very highly of Dr. Hudson, those persons who, you know, remembered him were patients of his and um, just talked about, you know, how a, a good person he was and how of a really good doctor he was. And um, I don't know when he left the practice at Laurel, but as I said, I did not uh, go there, but many of them did and remembered him very fondly. Yeah, because as I said, uh, this house is still occupied in Laurel. This family lives there. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's great. So uh, again, this kind of highlights uh, research practices, partnerships, uh, and, and you know, working to build out our collection, uh, and then just kind of you know being able to incorporate it and, and tell uh, a, a new to us story. Um, you know, part of Laurel's, Laurel's healthcare stories. That was the name of the exhibit um, two years ago now, 2019, if you can believe it. Um, so I wanted just to kind of go through a couple of photographs now that are really questions. <laughs> we know a little bit of information or we know no information, uh, but they've been donated to us. So we are trying again to fill in some of these questions and look, uh, kind of, you know, build out the stories. And uh, I'll start it off just real quick with, um, with this picture. And um, what happened is the, the photographs here that you see uh, came as probably a, a package of maybe six or eight photographs uh, of the same event. And they were labeled Hopkins 90th birthday. And as I, was, as I was scanning them to put them into our database system, I could see that the picture uh, on the left, and I apologize because it looks like it's uh, flipped here in the, in the screen, but uh, it says 103. So there's 103 <laughs> candles uh, on her birthday cake. So I was like, well, why does it say 90 if, if the cake and, and the, the balloons say 103? So, um, so if I can um, just point out that uh, on the picture on the right, uh, I recognized uh, someone from our community, uh, Miss Jackie Jones. So I reached out to her and she, she set the record straight. So she said it, it wasn't her 90th birthday. It was part of Miss um, Katie Hopkins, uh, uh, Catherine Johnstone Hopkins, um, and Miss Katie, as she was known in St. Mark's, was part of our 103rd birthday celebration, um, and that she, again, was very instrumental in the, the history of St. Mark's. She was a, a church organist, a pianist, she was a musician, um, and, and so this was, you know, part, um, part of her story and, and legacy. Uh, so this was good because it was a chance for us to, you know, to correct something that was passed down to us uh, incorrectly is mislabeled or could have been uh, associated with uh, another image in our collection. Uh, so this was a chance for us to, to set the record straight on that. Um, and Sandra, I know you have um, more information about uh, Miss Katie. Right. I was looking at the picture on the uh, right side. This was the last time that she visited St. Mark, came to St. Mark. She was in a nursing facility at that time and she came. It was one of our special services. I can't remember if it was a church anniversary or homecoming, but it was one of our major uh, cele celebratory days at St. Mark's. And she came and the pastor there is Pastor Robbie Morganfield. And as you can see, he's presenting her with something. You can also see Jackie Jones in the uh, far right of the of the uh, picture. Oh, Jackie just said this was homecoming. I knew it was one of our major days. And uh, she, I think this was the last time she came to St. Mark's. And uh, we were just all so glad to see her because her, she was just so instrumental in the music ministry at St. Mark's. Um, she was our organist, uh, pianist for about 46 years. I remember my mother telling me that she never accepted any type of payment for all that she did. She was a musician for every choir, basically every choir that we had, except for one children's choir that we had at one time. 
uh, where Mr. Joseph Watkins was the uh, musician, but she was just a, a, a great lady. She was just a great lady. We also remember her as an employee working at OW Fair uh, because those of us who went to OW Fair, if you lived on 10th Street or 9th Street, you went to uh, OW Fair. And Miss Katie lived on the corner of 9th Street and West Street. And uh, so it was really easy for her to get there. So when, because she knew all of us, she knew all of our parents, she knew our grandparents. I mean, when you went there, you really, you, you just, um, you were on your best behavior when you, you, you were there at OW Fair because you knew she was, she was just like the extra set of eyes that were on you when you were in that school. She was, as I said, she and both her sister the, the longevity in the family was something. Her sister, uh, Miss Ethel Baker, she passed away about uh, a week or two before her 100th birthday. Miss Katie lived to celebrate either 103 or 104 birthdays. Um, whenever you talk to her, she could remember things like it was yesterday, you know, and uh, she was just a, a wonderful lady. And we were just all so pleased that Jackie, um, brought her to St. Mark's on that homecoming Sunday because she was just, you know, a great lady of St. Mark's and she just was so instrumental in the, the history of the church. Uh, again, I, th I think that's great. And we, we did spotlight, uh, you know, her picture and, um, you know, her contributions uh, to Laurel uh, and to the African-American experience here. Uh, so we have her uh, also on one of our biography spotlights. Uh, and you can find that on our website as well as our social media pages. Um, I want to go through just uh, kind of quickly just to finish up our time here uh, through a couple of photographs that pose questions, like I said, to our, our collection. So uh, I know Sandra, you and I were talking about this picture and it came down to us as an undated photograph and it was identified uh, as being in Laurel, but we don't really have any other information about it. Uh, it I think it's a great little picture. You know, it shows a group of adults and children kind of gathered around a fence there. Um, but I know we had some questions, uh, Sandra, because we thought uh, that maybe the houses didn't look uh, quite right for Laurel. Uh, they look like there might be some duplexes, uh, some definitely two-story houses, um, similar to some of the mill buildings. Um, but do you have any other thoughts or analysis of this photograph? No, I, it was very intriguing, but I just didn't recognize the location of that picture at all. I don't know if anybody who's on maybe has any ideas as to um, the location of that picture, because I, I didn't. Yeah, and when you had a good suggestion is that you thought, because again, there is some similarity to kind of the, the duplex nature, kind of the two over two. Right, right. Um, Possibly it was a Burkhart. Mm -hmm. Um because I do remember some of the homes looking like that. Uh, could have been, you know, down there near the uh, Merkirk Iron, uh, the factory that was there. And, um, but I, it didn't look like Laurel to me. It looked more like uh, Merkirk. Right, um, yeah, we do that. Okay, so good, yeah. So Karen said that it could be connected to the Muirkirk Ironworks and Leon Dodson said... Oh, okay. Leon Dodson would know because he's a res he was a resident of He grew up in Merkirk. So he Wonderful. would know. Okay. Uh, okay. Well, yeah, yeah please, please connect with us. Reach out if you have um, some more information because, uh, you know, it's it, there's a connection, you know, with Laurel and, you know, you know some people, you know, just technically call it South Laurel. <laughs> it, just, it just kind of rolls rolls into it. But like we said, there's connections among the African American communities centered in Laurel and um, you know around it, like we said, with uh, Hall Town and Bacon Town uh, and Muirkirk. Um, so this was also a, a fun a fun little story as well. So uh, Ms. Sandra was not able to identify Carlos, but we have some really interesting information about the background of the picture. Do you want to tell us what, what you find out from? <laughs> well, thanks to my brother who remembers everything. Uh, he had said to me when we were discussing the picture that there were only two houses in in uh, the grove that had garages, the, the blue house 
Blues are right. They're both on, on 10th Street. And the Mac House. Um, however, I do remember that in the Mac House that the garage had an incline, a slope, and this one doesn't. So we realized that this was the, uh, the family. The last name was Blue. It was on their property. Now, the gentleman, we could not, we did not uh, recognize the name of Carlos. I don't know if anybody else who's on maybe recognized uh, him or the name, but we did recognize the property, just not the gentleman. Yeah, I, I think I think it's right. So yeah, if you happen to know Carlos, uh, again, it, it's kind of going uh, back away. So it might not be in living history anymore or living memory. Uh, it's dated 1938. Uh, but you can see uh, it, it's a great picture. There's the cars, the, the garage. Uh, and we, we also pointed out that it looks like there's like a plaque or a plate in the back window that says U.S. Mail. So uh, it might be that Carlos is um, like a postal worker or um, or somebody at, at the residence was at the time. And it just says on, on the back of the photo, it just says, it has a stamp. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, it, it has Fleet Photo Service, May 7th, 1938. Fleet Photo Service. Mm -hmm. Photo Service. Okay. And it has, it has a stamp, like a, it says certified, and there's some special stamp that I can't read. I made a copy of this. <laughs> okay, no, that's good. Yeah, because uh, and that's a great point because sometimes you know you have to flip it on the back and, and there might be information. Uh, so that so that's great. So maybe you know fleet, maybe like a fleet of postal cars or something. Yeah, just like um, but yeah. So there's there's some clues. So if if, if you are interested in helping us uh, piece that puzzle together, uh, please please let us know. I, I forgot about that. That's good. Thank you for 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 looking at the back of the photograph. So. Um, so we'll just quickly talk about uh, Teresa and her family. So we have a collection, these three photographs, and on the next slide, there's two more that uh, show Teresa uh, and some of her uh, children. Uh, and that's, that's really all we knew. So we have just the names and the date 1953 on these photographs. Uh, but again, Sandra was able to, to fill us in a little more uh, on, on her family, uh, at least her family name and a little bit of her relatives. Right, Teresa. Ms. Well, Teresa was a member of the Blue family. Um, they they lived at. Uh, I think the address was either. I think it was six o four, either six o two or six o four Tenth Street. And in the picture is uh, Teresa Blue. On the left, her son Melvin, and on the right, her daughter Virginia. And. Um, in the middle, the middle photo, it says Ms. Knox and Virginia. And people I've spoken to, we were trying to figure out who Ms. Knox was because the Mrs. Knox that we knew who lived in, in Laurel just didn't favor the lady who was pictured there. I mean, it could have been, because it was taken in 1953, it could have been Mrs. Knox's mother or something or a relative of hers, but we just did not recognize the lady herself. Uh, in the other picture, uh, we see t uh, Virginia again, and uh, um, next to her, on the right of her, is her brother Melvin, and we're thinking that the young man to the far right was her cousin Anthony, and they all lived in the house because Miss Virginia had a, I'm sorry, Miss Teresa, and I'm referring to her because that's uh, what we called her because she lived in the house next door to my grandmother. Um, there was, she also had another sister who lived there, Miss Doris Blue, and, um, Anthony, uh, was Miss Doris's, uh, son, if I'm not mistaken, but, um, it was nice to see this, because I had never seen these pictures as well, I mean, showing these pictures is really, in light my, uh, knowledge about the, the history of people in Laurel as well, because I had, never seen that picture. And I would not have recognized her if I had not seen uh, Teresa and Virginia. I mean, because they were older than, than, than me. And um, I was just glad that this picture at least was labeled. Yeah, thank you for that. And, and this, uh, I love the picture on the right too. Monica, uh, she pulled this out of our collection um, and it's in, it was in our 2020 calendar. Is that, is that right, Monica? I think it was. 
You did. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Okay. Yeah, which is it's just great. Yeah, you know, it's just a great little picture. You know, the girls are holding hands, and they're right by the river, uh, and the river looks really yeah. full. So there must have been you know, a real big rainstorm or something that came through. But uh, it, I just, it is great. It just, it just shows little kiss the family together. Um, and then we also, like I said, we had you know kind of two additional photographs in, in this collection of Teresa. Uh, and again, we think that there might be, you know, some sort of connection with the postal service. You said, Miss Sandra, we uh, we think Miss uh, Teresa was a postal right. worker. My mother told me that um, she did work for the postal uh, service, and that this picture was probably taken at the post office or somewhere near the post office. I think it looks as if she has on a uniform of some sort. Um, wasn't able to identify the gentleman on the picture on the right, but we did recognize. Uh, Ms. His name Virginia. is his name is Ben Harvey. Ben Harvey, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was labeled. Yeah, so again, it looks like you know he's probably in a uniform too. It looks like she's um, she's in uniform. Looks like they're at the train right, station. Train so station, yes. might be right. In fact, my brother had told me that she her route was probably from the train station to parts of um, Main Street, uh, something like that. But uh, yeah, this this picture was taken at the train station. And that one, um, it's stamped 1953. The one with the train station in the back in the background. Great. Um, yeah. So that, that that's a nice. Again, sometimes we get little you know collections of photographs that go together, like Miss Katie's uh, birthday celebrations, uh, and then you know kind of you know, because they all came together, like, like Miss Sandra said, uh, you know, we could put the children with the, with uh, Teresa in the other picture, you know, because they kind of overlap. So we were able to kind of, you know, put them together as they, they kind of tell the story of each other. Um, so it looks like uh, we have one other, one other kind of collection question and what's typed there uh, is what was written on the back of the photograph. So we have, again, about probably half a dozen or so pictures that came in and they're all kind of the same one you can see on the right or the left, sorry, that they're stamped November 1959. So there were some pictures of the Grove. So there was uh, St. Mark's, uh, the, the buildings beside St. Mark's uh, and some of the street scenes. So uh, the photograph is in the greatest quality. Uh, we could probably in, you know, enhance it as well. Um, but you, we have some information, we have some dates, and then we also have a, a little bit of, a, of an extra history about it. So, uh, Ms. Sandra, I know you said that you had a little bit of recollection of maybe that there was some sort of industrial building, uh, but can you tell us a little bit, bit more about where we think uh, Living Aluminum Company was? Well, if the only place it could have been was uh, at the far upper end on the street, uh, at the end of the street, there used to be a fence there, and maybe the aluminum factory was on the other side of what's now McCullough Field. And uh, because I know that uh, Cook's Lane was just uh, um, duplex homes, because I knew some people, as I said, some pe families that lived there, there was, you know, small po portion on each side. Uh, I think each one maybe had about one or two, I don't think they had, no more than probably about two bedrooms each. So uh, if you walked, you walked, went to the end of the street and then um, at the end of Cook's Lane, when you went to the right, you were on Maple Avenue. So I'm thinking that that uh, factory was on the, at, on the other side of the fence, as I said, where McCullough Field is right now. I really don't remember that too much. Uh, but that was, logically, that was the only place that that factory could have been located. But um, Cook's Lane, you know, we all, if you lived in Laurel, you all, everyone remembers uh, Cook's Lane, which is now Clay's Lane. Yeah, and if anybody's on the chat, if you have any recollections of that factory being there, or uh, that uh, industrial building being there, if you could just, you know, give us some insight about that. Yeah. Um, yeah, so it looks like Monica, um, thank you. You put in our information in the chat there. 
Um, so we do have a lot of these images and actually our objects as well. Uh, we have them digitized and they are free and accessible uh, to the public 24-7. Um, if you go to that, um, if you go to the Oh, where's my chat? I'm so sorry, I lost the chat. There we go. <laughs> so if you go to our, our website there, you, you can see um, our information there. And so I'll oh, just um, close here. Yeah, before you move on, some, Cynthia Whitfield, who was resident there, she said that that uh, industrial building would have had to been behind the houses that was on Maple Avenue. So as I said, it would have had to, you know, been in that vicinity somewhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, again, uh, we'll just put our information here. If you have any information for us, if it kind of jogged your memory and you just kind of start turning things over in your mind, uh, we would love to hear it, if, even if you even if you think it might be insignificant. It's like, oh, well, it could be this street or that street, or it could be this year or something. Uh, let us know, because like every every little bit helps, like the story of Dr. Hudson, even, uh, even a name can open up a whole entire uh, world or a corrected date, uh, you know, for in a photograph can lead to a whole different story. So if you have questions, comments, feedback on our conversation tonight, please let us know if you want to volunteer, if you want to help us out with some of our virtual endeavors. Um, let us know. I would just say one thing before we take a look at the question and go through the chat before we end today, uh, that we do have uh, one program still on the schedule. So this would represent kind of more of our traditional speaker series webinars. So uh, we have uh, two phenomenal uh, women uh, researchers who have done a lot with uh, the suffrage history of Maryland. So we're going to have them speak at our webinar on March 11th. Is that right? No, March 11th. Yep. And I'm going to put it, um, if I can get my mouse here to work, I am going to put the registration link here in the chat box. Uh, so if you can register for that, uh, we'll get you signed up for the next webinar. Uh, as for our next collection conversation, we don't have anything scheduled, but it will probably be toward the end of March. And if you have any ideas about what you kind of want to talk about with us, we would love to hear it. Um, next month, probably Monica will probably be Women's History, <laughs> I would imagine, uh, celebrating that in March. But uh, we have a lot of great things, and I uh, definitely encourage you to look at uh, that link that Monica posted to our online database because it's not only just the images, but we have about half of our collection, of, so about 5,000 images, records, archival documents uh, digitized. So you can do some research, you can just kind of do a random image search and just look through that. Uh, and again, if you have any information, we encourage you to, to get in touch with us. Um, and so, um, Monica, did you want to read the question or just kind of touch touch on it real quick, or do you need to, to sign off? Can you hear me? Okay, so we have one question uh, from Melissa Holland. I've learned a bunch about local Black history from the museum's digital archives, from documents Monica copied for me, and from speaking with Sandra. How would you? How will you build your collection going forward? How about oral histories from older St. Mark's members as begun in Mary Sullivan's brief interviews recounting experiences of inequality published in Laurel Leaders summer 2020? That's a really good question. <laughs> Uh, I, I think we are, I think we're just keeping moving forward as much as we can. Uh, the pandemic uh, hinders things in a lot of ways so we can't kind of sit down and look at photographs together. Um, but uh, in, in some ways, it, it helps make these connections a little easier because we can do Zoom and we can do uh, screen sharing and, and things like that. So we definitely want to keep on this, uh, this forward trajectory that we've been doing uh, with the oral histories that we started in the 2019 exhibit over at St. Mark's. Uh, and then just work more closely with uh, St. Mark's um, and Mount Zion over at Bacontown and uh, some of these other African-American communities kind of you know, a little further out from the historic district. Uh, and we encourage you, if you do have information, if you have copies you would like to share with us, uh, we're, you know, we're happy uh, and we, we need uh, to, to tell a better and more complete story of, um, of Laurel. So any information, any dates, names, or places, you know, we're definitely going to include that in our collection. And like you saw uh, with the transition of our current exhibit, we're really striving you know, to document history as it happens too. So that's uh, another kind of focus that we're, we're having at the Historical Society is to you know, document history as it happens. 
Um, any, I don't know, anything else, Monica, that you wanted to add to that or, or Ms. Sandra? I think I have one more question in the chat from Alicia Fields. Um, are these locations included in the walking tour booklet? Uh, I think some of them are, but not not all of them. Uh, the walking tour booklet is it's up there. It's, it's been it's been out there for a couple of years. Let's say um, I, I don't know the exact year, Monica. Do you remember offhand? When, no. Yeah, I don't remember exactly when the booklet was published. Uh, I know that uh, Karen uh, has done uh, some work uh, for like the the city's uh, walking tour, and you can still access some of the, the walking tour information that used to be on the city's app, uh, although it does need to be updated with some of the photographs. Um, so uh, a lot of the, the places, uh, a lot of the places are not on the walking tour, but some of the, some of the, you know, the historic uh, sites like St. Mark's, Emancipation Field, uh, uh, things like that will be included on that walking tour. Um, but if one of you should ask, we will uh, be having our walking, uh, historic walking tours coming up. So this is another program uh, that we wanted to put out to you uh, as, you know, kind of a, a way to um, not only deal with spring fever, but pandemic fever and as a way to socially distance uh, in a safe way, get out of the house. Uh, so on, I think, March 20th, uh, April 17th and 15th, we will be having uh, historic walking tours uh, of Laurel. And so for each of those different dates, we're gonna be focusing on a different area of Laurel. So we'll be talking about kind of the upper portion of Main Street and its history, uh, the lower port, uh, the portion of Main Street and kind of surrounding the train station. Uh, and then we'll also be uh, looking off of Main Street into Montgomery Street, uh, A Street and talking about the growth history as well. So even though it's not uh, in a printed form, uh, we're gonna be doing a lot more with uh, some of the locations that you heard tonight uh, in our upcoming walking tours. Oh. Um, can I say something? Yeah, of course, go ahead. Okay. Um, if anyone is, is interested in becoming a member, um, we have information on our website at laurelhistoricalsociety.org. Um, you, can, you can become a member online. You can actually, um, what am I gonna say? <laughs> you can actually um, uh, fill out the, the form online and become a member. Um, and also, if you become a member, you get access to all of the Sadler images that you, we just saw a few of them, but you, you get to see all the Sadler images, um, the digitized Laurel leaders, and the, what else? The mill papers? Yeah, some of the digitized mill documents, uh, the yearbooks, uh, yeah, like you said, and kind of some of the miscellaneous items that we've been able to digitize. Uh, so yeah, that's another kind of a perk of membership as well. You get access to some of these great photographs that we saw tonight. Yeah. Um, okay, well, I'll stay on for a few more minutes, but uh, I want to just thank uh, Ms. Sandra and Monica uh, for, for, you know, talking and just chatting with us and uh, everyone able uh, to to chat and to ask questions with us tonight. Uh, it really is a conversation, and I know it's a little different because we can't, you know, see or hear you, but we definitely uh, want to, to get your uh, take on this conversation. So we encourage you to reach out to us. Uh, and we would love to just connect with you. So uh, here is again is our uh, information. So you can email us or give us a call. Uh, and we just uh, thank you for spending your time with us tonight. And uh, we just really cross our fingers and, and hope that everyone uh, stays safe uh, and healthy and that we'll see you at the museum uh, coming up before too long.